We heard reference to the seraph serpent a few weeks ago in the Sunday Gospel, and we hear it again from the source, from the book of Numbers. And, and you basically know the story, but the bottom line of that story, this section of it, is grumbling and complaining. As a matter of fact, we use that grumbling and complaining, and we name it Ma Manessa, and, and another city in the area of the Holy Land in the desert. And what happened was, the people were slaves. You know, we're never satisfied, you know that. They were slaves in, in Egypt. God inspires Moses to lead them out. He does all the things that he's supposed to do, and you know the, the plagues and all those, those horrible experiences that befell the Egyptians, and we, we hear that on at the Easter Vigil readings. And we remember, these are our roots. So they, they leave. They go through the Reed Sea, and they're on, on their own. They're in the desert. Mother's starving, though. They're hungry. God sends manna, a, a, a tamarisk plant, that they, they can eat, they eat it. Moses hits the rock, water comes out, they can drink it. But they're still complaining. You took us out of Egypt, where we were slaves, but we ha at least we had a bed to sleep on. We had probably gruel for meals once a day. But here we're starving in the desert. See, I mean, yeah, we're talking about the Israelites, but you know what? We're talking about ourselves because we're never satisfied, I think. We always want more. So Moses pleads to God, please help these pain in the neck people. Uh, he says stiff neck people, so I can say pain in the neck people. He, help these pain in the neck people. And again, think about ourselves, us being a pain in the neck to God. And we know what he's done, but sometimes we need to re-experience it in our own lives. So God says, Okay, the serpents are coming out, and they're biting people, they're eating people. They're no, normal serpents in the desert. That's, that's normal. So he asks for something that foreshadows centuries to come, the crucifixion. But we don't know that yet. Okay? So Moses is inspired to make a seraph serpent, and he holds it up on a stick, and everyone who looks at the seraph serpent is healed and revived. Okay. They're still not satisfied, but for now, they got it made. Okay, so they're satisfied, and they go a little more toward the journey of the promised land. Jesus recalls that. The dissatisfaction of the people, I don't want to say pained God, but aggravated God, to the point where he intervened miraculously and gave them the seraph serpents a healing object. He recalls that when he realizes that everything that he's done for us, he healed people, he multiplied bread, he rose people from the dead, everything, they want more. They don't believe it. Tell us who you are. And Jesus is saying, my, my, my work should tell you who I am. Again, 21st century, your and my works, your and my attitudes, your and my way of praying should tell the world who we are, lifted up with Christ. Okay. So then he goes on to clarify, you know, you, you guys just don't understand. You, you condemn because you don't believe in, I, in who I am. Now, the, in the scriptures, we write that phrase, I am, it's always capitalized. And if it could be in the original language, it would be Amy, Amy. I am who I am goes back to the time that God revealed who he was to Moses in the burning bush. Moses said, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? God said, Amy, Amy, I am who I am. So that phrase you can't just use lightly, I am. Can't use lightly in the Holy Scriptures. And when Jesus says, I am Amy, Amy, he's telling them who he is. But the thick skulls don't get it through their heads. Show us more. Tell us how, 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 you, how you're relating to us. And then he says, you know, I'm leaving, and you're not going to be able to follow me because those who follow me will be my followers who, who trust me and love me. Again, I hope we are counted among that group. 
and we're moving toward Passover, Last Supper, Holy Week, and we even symbolically cover the statues in our church as a way of reminding us of that historical thing when Jesus goes away from them and they can't find him. Where I am going, you cannot come. Preparing for the resurrection, preparing for the crucifixion. So when we read the scriptures, as we're so close to Holy Week, this is Passion Week, we're so close to Jesus' great gift to us, his everlasting life. We have to knock on our heads and say, hey, wait, wake up. When I pray, I pray to God who hears me. When we place our prayers before the Lord, he hears us. And you know what? So does Satan. So Satan hears your prayers. And he's doing his darnest to aggravate you, to confuse you, to put confusion into our world. He's the prince of lies, don't forget. We saw that yesterday in Colorado. For un some unknown reason to me, this guy goes in and shoots up a supermarket, killing at least 10 people. People who are just going about their business, then we had the other shooting in the, in the massage parlor, in whatever state that was. And we have these things all the time in our world. They are Satan's way of telling us, I'm here, folks, and I'm doing my darnest to get you to not believe in Jesus Christ. I'm here, folks. I want you to look at me. Satan, evil, prejudice, hate personified in Satan and push Jesus aside so then we could be identified with those Pharisees that Jesus is saying, you know, you're going to be condemned because I've told you everything and everything I told you comes from the Father and everything I told you is true. But at times you choose not to believe the perpetrator worked with the inspir inspiration of Satan, I'm sure. Everything we, we, in our world reminds us of the strength of Satan. This is holy season. This holy season preparing for Good Friday in a week or so is a reminder that Christ conquered Satan as the ultimate power but he's still prince in the world. He's still alive and active in the world. And then, and then we, we come into the scene. What is our choice? Do we believe in Jesus? Do we pray as if we believe? Do we pray as if our prayers are answered? And they are when you pray for them, whether physically asking for healing or anything else doesn't look like it's being heard. When we pray, we are honoring God. It's all in his hands anyway. But when we pray, we're saying we honor you. We know you have the power to do, and you know, I've said it more than once, and it comes from the Lord's Prayer every day. The foundation of my prayer life is your will be done. And that works for me. Knowing that it's not me, I pray for my, my, my niece's healing, I pray for Maura's healing, I pray for all the intentions we have on our altar, I pray for the souls of those people killed in Colorado and their families and their consolation, and your will be done, that they experience that consolation and that loss. It's not an accident that Jesus died. He died for us so we know what death is. He died for us so we know what suffering is. We'll all be there. He also rose from the dead to tell us who he is. And if we die with him, we rise with him. We put our prayers before the Lord as later on we have the sacrament of anointing of the sick, 
We put our prayers before the Lord. He hears them. We're glorifying him. And if you hear and you have eyesight problems, when you leave after the anointing, you, your eyesight may not be healed, but your heart is healed, knowing that God touched you. And God hears every one of our intentions. Imagine that. Every one of our prayer requests are heard by God, given to him by Jesus Christ. We do that because of faith. He's with us. He hears us. They rejected him 2,000 years ago. They reject him today. And hopefully they won't reject him tomorrow. But if that happens, we need to be identified with Christ who is raised up.